likely came from a bat with perhaps some other animals in between. While there's now a light at the end of the tunnel for this pandemic, we very well may encounter another in our lifetime. A policy paper published earlier this year in the journal Science suggested that there may be upwards of 800,000 unknown viruses in animals that could make the jump to humans. When we're talking about dealing with new viral threats, the conversation often focuses on treatment like vaccines. These are certainly important, but they aren't about prevention. Today, we are very lucky to have with us two wildlife epidemiologists who have done extensive research that's helping on the prevention end of things. This includes things like surveying wild and livestock animals for viruses, research on the circumstances that need to line up for a virus to move from one species to another, a process called spillover, investigating how human activities may be increasing the likelihood of such spillover events, We'll also talk about what can be done once a new viral threat emerges, how public health agencies, academic institutions, environment and tourism agencies, and more are and can take steps to quash an outbreak before it becomes a full-blown pandemic. I'm thrilled to be talking about all of this with Jonah Mazet, a professor at UC Davis and founding director of the One Health Institute, which we will hear more about. Jonna is also on the board of directors of the Global Virome Project, an organization whose work led to that scary virus number I mentioned previously. We also have Raina Plowright, a professor at Montana State University, who's done extensive research on bats and the viruses that they carry. This work includes investigating the processes and events that lead to spillover. Raina is a lead investigator for Bat One Health, which focuses on bat-borne pathogens and develops recommendations to stop spillover. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone to add their questions to the question box. If they're not addressed during the to and fro of the discussion, I'll ask them in the last part of the event. Jonah and Raina, thank you again for joining me to talk about spillover and preventing pandemics. In addition to your PhDs, you both have veterinary degrees. Let's start with how you got each of you got involved with this field of work. Uh, Jonah, do you want to go first? I know that some of your early work focused on sea otters. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I'm really thrilled to be with you today. Thank you, Rachel, for having me. And um, it, when we think about the interconnectedness of, of people's health, animals, the environment, even plants and our foods, um, it's important to really be um, thinking broadly about what's happening in the world. And I got that introduction really early in my career, as you mentioned, when I first was working on my PhD. And even before that, while I was finishing up veterinary school, I was lucky enough to be working with sea otters and um, helping to try to save uh, the species that was threatened here in California. And very quickly, what we found was that the, the diseases that were killing sea otters were um, coming from human habitation in the coastal climate. And uh, unfortunately, what was killing sea otters was also killing a lot of friends in my San Francisco Bay Area home uh, due to HIV AIDS. As you know, people um, die of secondary uh, infectious diseases often. Um, because of the altered immune system with HIV AIDS. So it very quickly brought everything together for me um, about the connection of our environment and um, what we need to do to stop uh, impacting our earth so much because it is in fact ourselves uh, that put us at risk uh, from these infections. It's not um, the environment or some crazy viruses that are out there lurking to jump into us or even the animal host. So in trying to save sea otters, I realized there was a lot we need to do to the planet um, to be better to the planet to save ourselves. Great. And Rena, you were a veterinarian for both wild and domestic animals on several continents, including Antarctica. What was that like and how did you end up focusing on bats? 
Uh, it was a long road to bats, but I started off wanting to work on wild animals and um, particularly I was interested in endangered species when I was a veterinary student. And then I had these opportunities to be involved in wildlife projects like in Antarctica. So Australia, which is where my, my home country has this very large Antarctic program. And I was able to go down and work on penguins and seals while I was a veterinary student. And then when I was a veterinarian. But what I think the, the real change for me was when I went to UC Davis to do my PhD and master's and I was very lucky to be at a school that had a very strong ecology program, veterinary program and epidemiology program. And so I decided to take a course in ecology there and that just it blew my mind because ecology is it's really about the interconnectedness and interdependence of our natural world. And I realized that that was how my mind worked. It really I, I love this complexity dynamic systems. So then I was lucky to be able to then do my PhD also on bats right at the time when we were discovering that there were important hosts of emerging diseases. So bats had just been linked to Ebola, to SARS, to Marburg, uh, Hendra virus had just emerged in Australia and then Nipah virus in Malaysia followed soon after. And I did my PhD on Hendra virus uh, soon after its emergence, looking at the connection between landscape change and viral disease in bats. Okay. So that brings me to um, something I want to talk about right at the outset. We're going to be talking about a lot of viruses today and many animals that people may know or encounter. And um, I think it's important to say that while some of the conversation might get a little scary, uh, trying to rid the world of animals that carry viruses is not a solution. Raina, you said that bats are not the enemy, they are the canary. What does that mean? <laughs> Well, bats really are a signal of our changing relationship with the environment. So first, bats are so poorly understood by society. And I think that is because they're nocturnal, we're diurnal. They look different from most other species and humans tend to have a fear of things that are different. But bats are, are just fascinating. I mean, we, we have five gram animals, five gram bat brands bats can live 40 years. And the, the fact that and they're the only mammal that can fly, they have these huge metabolic rates every time that they fly 16 fold, yet they don't have metabolic stress, oxidative damage to cells, which is related probably to their ability to live a long life and not have senescence. So they're fascinating animals. They also, they do harbor many of these infections that are very dangerous to humans and, and to domestic animals, but they don't make bats sick. So we have a lot to learn from bats. Why is that? We think there's something special about their immune system, perhaps tied up to their ability to fly, that helps them to dampen the replication of the viruses and not have the, the ill effects of say inflammation caused by viral infections. So it's really important to, to, to be able to, um, to not take this out on the bats. Like we need bats, they're critical pollinators. They're, in fact, Australia, they're the bees of Australia, one of the most critical pollinators of native forests. They disperse seeds long distances, certainly helping uh, fragmented landscapes become more resilient in the face of climate change by dispersing genetic material long distances. And they consume huge quantities of insects. It's really important for agriculture. Also, we, we know now there's some good studies showing that if you do take this out on bats and so for example, culling bats, it backfires because the populations respond by producing more offspring that are susceptible to disease. And that can actually fire up. It's like adding fuel to a fire. It can make the outbreaks of, of pathogens within bat colonies worse. Um, plus, we need the ecosystem services that bats provide. So what we need to do is look at why are we suddenly seeing all these emerging diseases from bats? What can we learn from those processes? And then try to get really to the root cause of those diseases, to those emergence problems, rather than just blaming the bats. Okay. So we've talked a little already about um, some of the viruses bats carry. Um, 
I mentioned that scary number earlier, hundreds of thousands of viruses that could potentially infect people. That's a lot of virus. Uh, Jonah, you've been very involved with both the Global Virome Project and PREDICT, which has identified more than 150 coronaviruses alone that could potentially infect people and cause epidemics. Um, but many animals, humans included, carry viruses that never cause any harm. Um, how frightened should we be? And ca can you put some of these numbers in context? Well, I, I don't want us to be frightened. And you said it very nicely, Rachel. It, we're bringing up some scary topics, but I think this group, the audience here, is among the, the individuals who really help generate the knowledge that can reduce fear. And um, that has been a big uh, driver for me. Um, the, the idea that there are many viruses out there that we don't know about is what's behind the Global Virome Project and that it is completely within our capabilities now to find those viruses and characterize them and understand the risks that we put ourselves in by the way we interact with their hosts or the environments in which those viruses exist. Um, so I think it's important to uh, understand that there are definitely underlying drivers um, that, uh, that are increasing our risk for being exposed and infected with these viruses. So with our PREDICT project that you mentioned, we worked in more than 30 countries around the world with the communities and the governments of those countries to identify hotspots. And we use um, work, uh, previous, much previous work by Jones et al to start out looking at the globe and finding hotspots. And those early uh, models were driven by uh, human population growth and biodiversity. And over time, we were able to improve those models by getting more data um, that fed them, that showed that land use change is really uh, an important uh, predictor or driver of this connection. And that makes sense because when we disrupt a system, so your own system, when you're disrupted, you're stressed, you're um, out of sorts, you're hungry, your body gets out of equilibrium. Often you might get a cold sore, you might get sick. Um, it is the same for ecosystems. So if we disrupt an ecosystem, we change the way that the land is being used in that ecosystem. It disrupts every part of that ecosystem, including the organisms and microorganisms that are in that ecosystem. So for the hosts, uh, humans may become more susceptible when they're stressed and working in a changing environment, cutting down forests to make um, room for agriculture. Um, the animals, the native animals, the evolutionary hosts of many viruses um, are also out of, become out of balance. And what we know from that is that they tend to shed more virus. So while we evolve with our own viruses and we're less likely to be sick from them, especially when we're in balance, the same happens with all the other animal hosts. It's very unusual for a evolutionary host, a, a reservoir, if you will, um, like a bat, and when we're talking about coronaviruses, um, that to really be able to be sick from that virus, but that doesn't mean that they don't harbor that virus, it doesn't replicate in them and spill over and be available when they are stressed or when their life history events um, push that virus uh, that's evolved with them to be shed. So with PREDICT, we were able to look at those hotspots, both from a global perspective and a very local perspective, where we had transmission interfaces that were at high risk for viral sharing amongst the animals and including humans in those ecosystems. And we were able to intensively sample certain species in those locations and really look at the viral discovery. So the more individuals we sampled, the more virus we found, but as we pushed that out into time, we saw that we were saturating that viral discovery curve. And what that showed us was that there was a discoverable non-infinite number of viruses in each of the host species that we could predict how many samples we needed to take to get all of the viruses or nearly all of the viruses in those species. And, um, and then we would um, also understand how much it costs to sample them. So that viral discovery curve helped us to understand that we can 
find all the virus that's out there and it's knowable and we could do it in a 10 year period and it would cost less than 10% of a single response to a large epidemic and, it, and less than 0.01% of what this pandemic is going to cost us. So I think we can reduce that fear by um, really being more knowledgeable. Great. We'll come back to um, some of the things you've touched on again. For now, uh, Raina, you've done a lot of work investigating the circumstances and mechanisms um, that lead to spillover and how this can lead to a pandemic. A simplified version of what happens is captured in four words, infect, shed, spill, spread. Please explain. Sure. And if I can keep talking about uh, bats here, bats and viruses, to keep it simple. So, so we have been working about on what are all of the processes that have to come together to allow the passage of a, a pathogen from an animal um, or one from one species to another. And that's called spillover. When it's from an animal to a human, that's called zoonotics, zoonotic spillover. And we've been able to simplify to those infect, shed, spill, spread stages. And so if you think about it, you, you have to, you've got to have an infected reservoir host. So the, we have to have, say, a bat that's infected on the landscape. That infected host has to be able to release that pathogen somehow so it's available for the next host. And that happens in many different ways. So for coronaviruses, we know that they're shed by bats in feces. Uh, for the henipaviruses, the hendra and nipa viruses that, that I work on, they're shed in urine. But for something like Ebola, that the release may actually be during the butchering and preparation of the carcass of a bat for bushmeat hunting, as an example. Uh, then the virus has to be able to, to make that jump into the next species, so that spillover. And it sounds simple, right? That pathogen just jumps from one individual to another, but it's actually very complicated and it's probably very hard. So if we think about every time we leave our house and breathe the air, we are bombarded with pathogens from or microbes from other species. It might be fungi, it might be bacteria, viruses from plants, from soil, from cats, dogs, birds. But we rarely get sick. And that's because we have a lot of barriers from our immune system, from all sorts of barriers that stop that from happening. So if we think about what has to happen for that bat virus to actually get into a person and cause an infection, well, it's going to be able to get into a human cell. And so the cells will have receptors. You can think of it like as a lock. The virus has got to have the right key to get into that receptor. So for SARS-CoV-2, they are bind, the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor in humans. But actually many of the coronaviruses in bats don't have the right protein to be able to gain entrance to human cells. Once the virus is in the cell, it's then going to be able to take over the machinery within the cell to replicate itself. It then has to be able to get outside the cell, and that's no mean feat. It's actually really one of the big barriers for influenza viruses in, uh, from birds infecting us. Then it's going to be able to get to more cells, spread through the body, overcome the innate immune system, get to the right tissues for spread. So there's a lot of processes involved. Um, so we also then it has to be spread amongst humans and of course um, that's facilitated by our uh, large communities, road building and, and so on, all the various uh, ways that we increase connectivity of human communities. Okay, and that so that leads nicely into where, where we are today. Um, the current pandemic, everything lined up just so. Uh, Jonna, can you break down for us what happened and are, could things have been done differently to change how things unfolded? Yeah, first there was information within our reach. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, there was information that was in our within our reach that we, we didn't have and we still don't have. And that is uh, we need to understand the viruses and their transmission circumstances. Um, and we know, for example, that many, many more spillover events are happening 
than um, we had ever thought of before. And so uh, Reina mentioned uh, Ebola. Well, we can do uh, specific serology for different filoviruses now and understand in different regions, there is much, much more frequent spillover um, of Ebola into humans uh, that doesn't result in either severe Ill enough illness um, to be detected or to be diagnosed, even in endemic areas, um, than, or, or it does it, it just one person gets sick and dies. Because frankly, uh, around the world, people get fevers and die and go undiagnosed um, most frequently frankly, they, they either get better or they go undiagnosed. So fevers of unknown origin is a big issue that we need to address. We also know from coronaviruses, in China specifically, we've done work, our team's done work and shown that people that interact with and work with animals have a much higher seroprevalence to SARS-related coronaviruses specifically than others. So we didn't take advantage of these risks that we were knowledge about, knowledgeable about, and we didn't um, do broad scale viral discovery and circumstantial um, analysis to be able to characterize risk. Um, second, uh, we really, um, unfortunately, many countries missed the boat. So I'm really proud of our predict teams. Um, our predict teams around the world actually jumped in. And even before there was a specific diagnostic test for SARS coronavirus 2, they were able to use um, more broad coronavirus protocols that we used in predict for virus discovery. And they were able to diagnose the very first cases being introduced from China into their countries. This happened in Nepal, this happened in Thailand, this happened in Cambodia. And what that meant was before, uh, you know, the second or third week in January, these countries were already identifying introduced cases and throwing their public health systems at it full steam ahead. So some of these countries have much more active and um, frankly compliant populations that when uh, the government says there's a risk, put on your masks, uh, stay home, um, they are uh, more likely to do it than some other countries. So um, so that was another miss in uh, countries that we see still are really challenged. And, and in the US right now, we're so horribly challenged and back on lockdown and our, our ICUs are, are, are almost out or out of capacity in many areas. So that's the second problem. And then I think the third and bigger problem and another one that we can completely fix is that the academic sector was not fully integrated with the government sector and the private sector. Um, there had been good work done. We actually knew that coronaviruses were a big risk. We knew scientifically and academically, we were waving the flag uh, that we should be ready for this. And disease X was beginning to show up on things like the WHO blueprint um, and even in drills, but we didn't provide a plan that was integrated across all the surge capacity needed, um, especially I think bringing academia um, and academic labs that can do testing. We didn't bring those resources to bear um, for months and months. And that just delayed our response and let the virus um, fortunately spread or we spread it um, throughout uh, our nation. And it similarly happened in many other um, countries where, where people were just a little too comfortable. So making sure we integrate and making sure that we inspire confidence uh, in um, science is really, really important. So thank you for this forum. Uh, and thank you for Raina and other scientists who are stepping up and really, um, you know, uh, taking on the burden of, uh, it shouldn't be a burden, but it's a, it's a lot of work. We all like to go and just do our research, right? And taking on this new area that we're maybe less comfortable with of really speaking out and speaking to the public and making science accessible is, is critical, but it's, uh, but it's an added task to busy people's lives. So thank you, Raina, for that. Thanks, both of you. Um, so early on in that scenario, the the um, there's the tracking of viruses, monitoring wildlife, um, 
Raina, you've done a lot on how human activities play a role in the emergence of um, infectious diseases in terms of how we use and interact with the environment, whether agriculture or palm plantations um, or just the expanding human population. Can you talk about that relationship between um, ordinary human activity that's going on and how that relates to the emergence of, of new infectious diseases? Sure. And I could go back to just that infect, shed, spread, spill, spread, uh, cascade, and, and think about all of those processes that are happening on a landscape. And so they're all affected by how we are treating the landscape and how we're affecting the animals that live and interact on those landscapes. So just if we start at an infection, we talked about having an infected reservoir host. Well, you know, if, if you go to a crowded bar, you're more likely to get infected with SARS-CoV-2. And that's the same for animals. I mean, animals, they don't go to bars, but they are also forced into situations of crowding. So for example, um, during a drought at a watering hole, we'll see the ungulates crowd around that, that, that resource. When food is limited, animals crowd around the resource. Uh, elk on haystacks in agricultural areas, for example. Or we see actually the exact opposite. And that's what we see in Australia, where we've been able to track the bot bat populations over uh, 24 years, we've seen that when food is not available, the bats actually disperse into many small populations. They fragment across the landscape because there's little energy for, for bats so that they, they roost really close to reliable sources of food which are usually very crappy in quality. It's kind of like camping next door to McDonald's because you don't have the energy to go to that nice restaurant you'd really prefer to travel to. Um, so uh, we're also thinking about the, the next, if you think about we've got infected animals on the landscape, but we then have to get those pathogens into to humans that spill over. And that's all about our, our behavior and wildlife behavior. So the human wildlife proximity. And as we fragment landscapes, we create edges. And those edges are places where animals and people can interact. As we create roads, we create access for humans into these high risk uh, situations, whether it's bushmeat hunting or guano gathering or any sort of interaction. If we think about this, we are, in the next 25 years, we are going to double the, the uh, mileage of paved roads on the planet. And that is going to be happening in high diverse areas that are more likely pristine at this point in time. So we have a, a crisis really on our hands in terms of human wildlife proximity. And then the, there's the spread uh, issue amongst humans. And when Ebola was uh, un understood as this pathogen that was emerging in Central Africa with limited outbreaks in isolated villages. When Ebola emerged in West Africa in highly dense urban populations that were well connected, it exploded. And so that's where, where our, our human settlement and density is really important in how these pathogens can spread once they do that emergence out of wildlife into humans. So that, that ties nicely in with the One Health approach. Jonah, um, let's talk about this. The, it works from a premise that human health is very intertwined with the health of animals, plants, and the environment. Um, tell us about the idea behind the organization and, and the organization, what it's doing. Yeah, so um, organizationally, thank you for mentioning the One Health Institute. We're really proud to have been uh, working at uh, the interface uh, that we mentioned, the interface of human, animal, and environmental health, uh, including our food, uh, for decades now. But um, I, I think it, a good example of how One Health all comes together is thinking about the food chain. And if we add uh, into the mix of what we might, uh, those of us listening to this uh, webinar might think of as a traditional food chain, if we, we add wildlife into that food, human food value chain, I think it helps to bring this one health concept really home. And that is that we are all connected and what we do uh, and what we desire 
um, and what we buy is connected way upstream to other effects that affect our health, um, like where we get the food. So for example, in Vietnam, rodents are a um, regular food item. And um, rodents in Vietnam, when they are out in the field and are, uh, we can, are being captured, frankly, by hunters to put them into the food value chain, we know that um, we can detect prevalences around 20% for coronaviruses. And then as they get into the uh, large market setting, and just as Raina said, you get them concentrated into uh, uh, mixed species and small spaces uh, in a market, then we see that um, prevalence of coronaviruses jump up above 30%. And sadly, when it gets into the food um, delivery portion, so in the restaurant, we see the, um, the uh, prevalence getting above 50%. So 50% of the people in the restaurant are potentially exposed um, to coronaviruses. So that, those rodents that are running around in the field and every person that handles them through that food value chain, and this works for poultry and others, um, are, are amplifying that effect, again, along that pathway that Raina so eloquently described. So when we think about One Health, what we really want to do is we want to take two central tenets. That is one, that it can't just be someone like me, an epidemiologist studying data that's um, been collected somewhere else, we need to bring all the disciplines together collaboratively, have mutual respect, and really be working to solve these big problems. So it's an integrated approach. You need the, the hunters, you need the farmers, you need um, the uh, all the different disciplines uh, in human public health, in ecology, uh, in uh, environmental engineering. You need to bring those minds together to really think about every step along each pathway of a problem um, to solve it. And then you need to put your energy at those interface and connections among people, animals, and the environment, uh, and the food, including plants, uh, to be able to really solve these problems. I'm glad you mentioned um, farmers and, you know, I don't want um, people to think that this is just you know, exotic species in strange lands. How does the agricultural sector, um, we know pigs, swine, there's swine flu, there's bird flu, um, is, is part of the way forward about um, integrating the agricultural sector more into some of these efforts? Where does that fit in, Jonah? Yeah, I truly believe that um, that that's another piece. Just as I mentioned that, you know, where we went wrong with this one uh, was not having the different parts integrated and talking to each other. I think moving forward, uh, and we've seen it even with influenza, especially in the past, with, if we don't um, actually engage uh, large agriculture, small and large agriculture, and think about the uh, agricultural systems, we're really not going to be able to address these problems. And there are some real barriers uh, to bringing those sectors together. It's not just like, hey, let's talk. Um, you know, there are uh, proprietary issues, there are biosecurity issues, but the concepts that underpin them are exactly the same and the ones that we've been discussing today. And that is the more intensively we uh, push animals like people in cities or animals on intensive farms uh, together and stress them and mix them, the more likely we're gonna share pathogens. So it behooves us uh, to work together, but there are some obstacles around profit and um, and lots of other issues uh, for doing. Okay. Um, Raina, the, I know some of your work um, has focused on um, the spread of viruses from bats to horses. You've worked with veterinarians in Australia who have to don hazmat gear when they're going to um, treat horses for, um, and then palm plantations, um, palm, for palm oil, bats, 
drink that up like soda pop? How, how do, how can you tell us a little bit about um, places where spillover is perhaps becoming common or is somewhat predictable? Um, and yeah, what we're learning from, from studying those areas. Sure. I, I do hear a lot. Um, many people say spillover is unpredictable, that it's this rare stochastic event that we'll never be able to predict. And I, I just don't think that is true. I think it is true for some systems, but I think the, the key is when you do, you have data and you start to pull together uh, an understanding of the mechanisms on every part of that spillover process actually can get to a point of prediction. But if we think about something like, um, like coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, this is the third coronavirus that has emerged into the human population. So bat-borne coronavirus emerging into the human populations in 20 years with uh, SARS in 2002, MERS in 2012, and now this, this virus. And each of those events has probably been a single spillover event from a bat to another species and then then eventually into humans but if we're thinking of spillovers that's a that's n equals three and that's just not enough data to be able to understand that spillover process or get to any point in prediction so what we do is we, we look to places where spillover is common and then try to disentangle all of the mechanisms build data build models to understand the process uh, so that's why we work in in bangladesh and Nipah and hendra in australia where we see spillover every year uh, australia is particularly becoming this model system because we have spillovers, but we also have long-term data on the bats, 24 years of ecological data on, on the bats. And what we see, we don't see spillover just evenly every year. We'll see one, two, three years where we may have one or two spillover events or none, and then we'll have a burst. And that may be five, six, seven spillover events where we see sick horses because they've got Hendra virus from a bat that then allows us to try to find patterns. What's different about those years when we have a big cluster of spillover events or in years when we have none? And, and we've been able to now find, delineate those factors that we think what, what's happening is we've got a massive loss of winter habitat of bats. So in winter is always a tough period because there's no nectar. We also have natural climatic cycles of El Nino, La Nina. And when we have this interaction or intersection of this climatic cycle with this habitat loss, we get periods when the bats don't have enough food. And that's what I described before when they split up into small groups and go and feed on, on poor quality foods. And that tends to be in agricultural areas and urban areas. So that creates then this interface where bats are next to horses. Uh, my PhD student has put uh, GPS trackers on bats and we've looked at where they go, what they do during these periods. And what we find is that when there's no native food, no native nectar, the bats are feeding on fruit in horse paddocks. But when there's nectar, their behavior is totally different. I mean, it's 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 like kind of watching, I don't know if you've ever given your kids soda and then just watching them like bounce off the ceiling for about <laughs> <laughs> it's literally what the bats do. Like when they have nectar, they fly 50, 80, hundreds of kilometers for the nectar. And then they bounce across the landscape, moving huge distances. We actually think they have to move extra miles to burn off the energy. <laughs> and when there's no nectar, it's like, they're in one place right next to this poor quality food. They just moved to the same tree night after night. It's really different behavior. And that's also when we see the bats shedding the virus, when they don't have that natural food, when they're just really low in energy. So we think that there is this, this um, perhaps not enough energy for them to allocate to their immune response. And therefore these viruses that they're naturally infected with are suddenly shed in, in large quantities. And that's when we see spillover. I want to just remind people to submit questions, which we'll turn to in just a moment. I just want to ask uh, Jonna one more thing relating to what Raina just talked about. So we have some some systems that are very well studied and um, or relatively anyway, and we may know where to look um, in terms of the work of one health and predict Jonah and a lot of it seems involves training local people on the ground um, what are the to to maybe start to gather data that can inform um, 
measures, preventive measures we could take in years to come. What are some of the challenges to, um, to getting local people involved and trained? Are there places where this has worked especially well? Are there things that make it more challenging than others? Well, this works begins and ends in communities and um, communities need educational leaders and educational systems that can help to inform. And, and I think, you know, as I've been saying, getting the knowledge requires the global community to participate. So um, certainly we're very proud to have support from the US Agency for International Development to build a One Health workforce. And we're working with more than 100 faculties um, throughout Southeast Asia and Africa uh, to really bring these concepts into primarily uh, uh, graduate education and undergraduate education, but even dipping down into uh, K through 12 level uh, primary school education. Uh, it is challenging um, in that primarily the experts are in uh, the, the global north, if you will, or the more developed countries. And that's not right, that the, the more developed countries don't usually bear the burden um, of at least the beginnings of these events um, or the day-to-day -day events. Certainly we are now um, because of our uh, maybe arrogance of being able to think that we've got everything handled. I think some of the low and middle income countries have done better. So we need to learn from each other um, and share information and uh, do twinning and um, really improve how people are um, thinking about these problems so that we can have a next generation of global thought leaders um, and educators to do this work. I think um, it's it, uh, very inspiring uh, that the scientific community has come together so nicely in response to this terrible tragedy. And we have really seen a level of collaboration in the scientific community like never before. And then not to let a good tragedy go to waste, um, just like we're doing now, the, uh, the Zoom platform, the, the Crowdcast platform, all the different um, electronic platforms are letting us work in ways that we never did before, or maybe make people more comfortable with working uh, remotely with each other and that is really, really changing, I think, the future of the planet because we also need to commute less, fly around the world less, um, and allow us to, to walk more gently and reduce those drivers that we mentioned, like travel, trade, climate from fossil fuel use. Um, so I think, I think there are some real benefits that we will recognize um, later, but it's hard while everyone's dealing with tragedy. So that brings me to a question we have from Annalise and something I wanted to ask anyway, which is what can um, what can inst what what can we do? You know, what can regular people do to aid in this preventing pandemic effort? And what should we be asking of our institutions and um, policymakers, our, our elected officials? Jonah, why don't you take this one? Okay, well, maybe Raina can top up. I think we, we all have ideas about this, but I, I do believe that we can benefit from um, what we're learning on, on drivers and think more upstream uh, about these issues and think about what our behavior is doing that causes us uh, to become exposed and, and more broadly, what our behavior is doing to upset ecosystems. Uh, and change um, the activities. So really that, that uh, pushes me to recommend that we um, you know, think about our, our behaviors, our consumption, our day-to-day -day activities that each one of us as an individual, not even as a scientist, as an individual can do to reduce our impact and walk more gently on the planet. Um, on top of that, um, I do think that we need to completely change our thinking around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in our country, for sure, um, the Black Lives Matter movement has helped to accelerate this thinking, and we can't go backwards from that. We need to continue to move forward. And many, many of the impacts that we're seeing, both the exposures and 
the outcomes uh, of that exposure are amplified in communities that had less access to things like education, nutrition, healthcare, um, and um, and those things cause predisposition, predisposing factors for severity of illness as well as exposure. So um, I think there there are things we can do to just be present in conversations and speak up for diversity and equity. Marina. I couldn't agree more. And that was so eloquently said, thank you. I, I would add um, that we need to embrace science um, become eloquent as everyday citizens be eloquent in the science and be proponents, advocates for science. Yesterday, I had to walk through a picket line of people with banners saying things ironically like, I want to be able to breathe at um, anti-mask demonstration. So we have a, a crisis in terms of our literacy and acceptance of science and our understanding of the scientific method really, I, I, you know, to understand how science progresses through these increments of understanding, always trying to, to um, discredit hypotheses and find better information, as opposed to we have to be perfect at the, at the beginning. It's not just how it works. Uh, I think then in terms of our advocacy for our place in this, the natural world, we, we need to understand that human health is, it's an ecological service. So it's a service that, that nature is providing us. So we need to protect nature to protect ourselves. It's also, it's a biosecurity imperative. And so programs like one where in Australia, we're trying to now replant that winter habitat that bats lost that we think is really the key or root cause of this whole spillover dynamic. Replanting that winter habitat, that should be a biosecurity imperative. Then there is the investment in the transdisciplinary research. And, and Jonna just said it so nicely when she described the One Health approach. It's, it's that massive uh, research effort of all the different disciplines trying to understand how is this happening? How are these spillover events on these landscapes happening? Because once we understand why and how they're happening, then maybe we can figure out what's the, the root cause, what's, what's generating this whole cascade of processes, and then address that rather than be in the situation now where we're just playing catch up on this pandemic that where they, you know, the cat left the bag a long time ago and it's really, really hard to contain. Let's stop it before it even happens. Related to that, we have a question about um, climate change and um, whether melting glaciers or um, climate change in general and how that relates to emerging infectious diseases. I think climate change is a problem that can feel far away and like an individual um, may not be able to do much to tip the scales in any way. Um, and it can also feel, you know, an optional concern like mask wearing perhaps. How How is climate change also um, a biosecurity issue, Raina. Maybe you can talk about some of the work you've discovered about bat in terms of bats. And Jonah, please add. Well, climate change is just it's disrupting all of our systems. So everything that we talked about, it's just exacerbated by by climate change. If we think go back to that infection spill spread cascade and I think climate is really determining where our, our natural resources are that the animals depend on. Where's the food, the flowering? For example, the bats depend, their preferred food is nectar from flowering native forests, but that's completely climate dependent as to when that happens. So when it doesn't happen or when it's unpredictable or even worse, when it happens all at once. So we have this synchronization effect of extreme climatic events. If all of the forests flower at one point in time, then all of the forests will stop flowering then at the same point in time and there'll be no food available. So it has a, a huge effect on these uh, natural systems. I think we see it more in the vector-borne systems where temperature, uh, all of the processes that determine how a pathogen gets from say a mosquito into a human are te temperature dependent. And so for pathogens like dengue that do really well at warm temperatures, climate change is increasing the distribution of disease across the globe. So many, many ways in which climate change is a problem. 
Yeah, I can just add on. Um, I completely agree. And and there are things that we can do as individuals. I know people think about it as being a really long term, um, you know, futuring kind of problem. But again, if you're sheltering at home and working from home, you're helping with uh, climate variability and long term climate change. So um, I commend you for that, even though I know it's difficult and and probably you don't have much choice. On top of that, um, I really want to just go back to your example, Rachel, about the polar ice cap. And um, there are things that are within our knowable frame, uh, time frame of, of people's careers, uh, rather than thinking about it as 50 years forward. A lot of people are asking me recently about, well, what about those viruses as they, the ice melts and the viruses that are in there coming out that we're not expecting. That's an issue potentially, but I think it's a fraction of uh, the problem that we have viruses that are already out that we're not even knowing and um, studying. And that's why we want to do the, um, that good work collaboratively across nations in the Global Virome Project. But we have been able to document pathogen movement because of climate change. So real health impacts um, happening right now can from climate change can be documented with this polar ice cap issue. And our team has shown that pathogens that previously circulated only in animals in the North Atlantic actually have moved into the Pacific now um, because of shrinking ice caps and the ability of uh, animals to change their migratory path pathways. So we're seeing vectors, mosquitoes and others changing their, um, their distribution because of warming climate, as well as large vertebrate seals um, moving with their pathogens into whole new ecosystems and exposing susceptibles. So it is very similar, frankly, to a sick person getting on a plane in one part of the world and moving to another part of the world. That one causing climate uh, problems while it happened. Um, someone has written in about minks, which I did want to um, make sure we talk about. Um, this goes back a little bit to our, our um, bringing agriculture into the fold in terms of, um, yeah, factory farms, uh, animals being raised on fur farms. Can one of you um, speak to transmission spillover, um, those situations and events? Well, yeah, I think and actually there's a report of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in a wild mink now in Utah, which is really, really concerning because one of our big worries with this pandemic is spilled back or reverse zoonoses when the pathogen in, is now spilled from bats into humans, is that now going to spill into other species like other bat species and so on. And, and mink have been one of the most susceptible other species that we have known. Actually, their relatives are used in experiments for uh, developing therapeutics and vaccines for humans. So the uh, aggregate, whenever you aggregate a lot of individuals in a small space, you're creating the uh, conditions that are very good for disease spread. I mean, it goes back to the bar example. We aggregate in a bar, we're more likely to get SARS-CoV-2. We aggregate a lot of animals in an intensive situation like a mink farm, but also like in wildlife trade, as Donna had said, uh, that the increase in um, the prevalence of coronaviruses was seen through the wild trade and again, that's bringing a lot of animals together at a really intensive, uh, aggregated experience. We're almost out of time. I want to um, ask each of you, let's start with you, Jonah, just if there's a moment that's um, stayed with you since the pandemic, whether related to your work or personal moment or otherwise. Well, you might be able to imagine that having worked um, for a couple of decades on emerging infectious diseases and trying to um, raise the flag or help people understand that we need to change our behavior, both uh, in the, the global community, as I mentioned, for um, it, the environmental impacts, but also in the scientific and political uh, climates to work better together um, to be able to trust each other and inform each other and find solutions um, that um, seeing that not happen, uh, especially in 
uh, my own country where I work every day uh, has been completely devastating. Um, I've seen uh, three of my friends lost parents already to um, COVID-19. And um, I really, I guess have been trying to help for a long time and it's been pretty hard to be in the situation of now, now what? But you just get on with it. You contribute, you, um, I've been just trying to continue to advocate for science and continue to show that, that the risks are knowable. We can rank the risks from viruses that we find. Um, Raina's described some of that. We've done a bunch of work with uh, many, many scientists around the world to come up with risk factors and ranking criteria for viruses that are newly discovered. All of that is possible, but we need to do the work. We need to do it collaboratively, and then we need to act on it. So two moments in the pandemic, I think of really bright, of many, as many, so many, but I, I think getting that first email alert about a, a new virus in Wuhan, undiagnosed pneumonia, finding out it was a SARS-like virus, a bat virus, and then watching this unfold day by day, really hour by hour at the beginning. The second moment was I was boarding a plane in Bangladesh in January and I got a text with the New England Journal of Medicine article showing asymptomatic transmission. And I immediately donned my N95 mask and I remember my heart rate just beating and I thought, this is going to be really bad, really, really bad. And it was a, a moment of terror. And then just watching this unfold, uh, I've worked on the idea of pandemic potential pathogens my whole career, but the actual unfolding of the pandemic was just beyond anything I could imagine. So terribly awful beyond anything I could imagine. But there have been silver linings. And I'd say the, the silver lining for me has been watching my science colleagues just rally around this and put enormous amount of energy into doing everything they can to help when it's of no benefit really personally or professionally but just wanting to help whether it's setting up testing on campus whether it's communicating science whether it's helping our local public health officials it's really been inspiring just to see uh, wonderful people doing what they can to help others well, I want to thank both of you. It's an enormous um, service and it's been a pleasure as, as much as it's also very concerning stuff we're talking about. Um, so Jonah, Raina, thank you so much for joining today. Um, everyone in the audience, thank you for joining the event. Um, if it's been a good experience, we just launched a um, donation drive at Knowable, which is free to all. So please consider um, donating. You can do that at knowablemagazine.org. Um, I'd also like to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for their wonderful support of Knowable Magazine. Um, and again, special thanks to um, Jana Mazette and Raina Plowright for the fascinating discussion. This conversation will be posted on the Knowable website we'll, where it will be free to view and share. Um, look for the Reset collection and additional resources, including um, links to articles by Knowable articles that where, Rona, where Raina and Jonna have been interviewed, um, scientific papers, um, links to some of the um, projects that they're involved in are also will also be on that event page. Um, let me remind you that there, this is one in a series of discussions. The next one is how to change behavior during a pandemic from personal habits to public health. It's going to take place on January 15th at noon Pacific. The registration for that will be opening soon. And um, the best way to keep up with these discussions and as much reporting as we get to do on um, the work of Raina, Jonah, and other scientists is to sign up for our, our newsletter, which you can do at our, on our website, knowablemagazine.org. And that's all from me. Thank you, everyone. Have a um, safe and happy as you can holiday season. Thanks again for joining us. Take care. Happy holidays. Thank you. See you later.